I'm Nick Terzo, and you're listening to The Radical. Today, I reconnect with an artist for the first time in 26 years. During those decades, he has participated and contributed to a couple of legendary bands. As a drummer who found his early self influenced by the likes of John Bonham and Keith Moon, he's gone on to earn quite a reputation as a player himself. Coming off a 10-year self-imposed absence from the music scene, he recently formed a new band called Assertion, and their new record, Intermission, will be released in April. From Sunny Day Real Estate to the Foo Fighters, my guest has been involved with some seminal moments. William Goldsmith from the band Assertion joins me to discuss his new project, Seattle in the 90s, early Foo Fighters, and his decade-long self-imposed sabbatical from music. Coming up, my conversation with William Goldsmith. Hey, William, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited you have a new band. Mm-hmm. A new record coming yes, out sir. in April. Yep. Um, the new band's called Assertion. Yes, sir. Yes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the new record's Intermission, yes? Correct. Yeah. So tell me a little bit how this uh, kind of came together, how you met maybe uh, your co-collaborators, Brian, and is it Justin, too? Yeah. Justin, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Brian Gorder, Justin Tominga. Um, so Justin had reached out to me through Facebook and just to say hello and Basically that he, you know, had uh, really liked some stuff that Sunny Day Real Estate had done. And so he wanted to say, hey, thank you. I, I, you know, started working on drums around the same time I heard Seven and, you know, was trying to like play some of those fills. And uh, so I was like, well, that's that's awesome. And then I started looking into what he was doing. And uh, he teaches music and teaches music also to children with autism. And um, I that really caught my interest because um, my son Logan is uh, has autism. So so that really really grabbed me. And then I saw Pig Snout, his band with his kids Dahlia and Lucian, and it hit me really hard because I'd been kind of I'd been sort of hiding from music, sort of a self imposed exile kind of thing. Uh, for about nine years and I saw what he was doing with his kids and it just hit me like uh, it was a it, it slap of reality um, uh, shift of perspective big time it just made me realize that hiding from music wasn't just about my own issue or whatever it was it was it meant not sharing that part of myself with my children and I was like I can't I can't do, not do that anymore you know well, so, so that was a pivotal moment to that snapping your sabbatical yeah seeing him playing with his children and sharing that with his children lit the fire inside of me again to play and uh not to mention their songs were are amazing and just really really well well crafted and arranged so and uh and dahlia is amazing and lucian's amazing that's incredible and what yeah really cool. i mean during that time like when you say you took a sabbatical does that mean you just weren't creating your own were you listening to anybody else's music or were you literally like i'm shutting this i'm Completely shut it off. Didn't even listen to music. Wow. Yeah. Just completely just turned it off. So what did that silence do for you? I mean, what did that, what did that trigger in you kind of having that noise kind of? I don't know. That's kind of difficult to answer. Um, I don't think I recognized what turning it off was doing to me until I started playing again. And I had realized that, that I had been, uh, harming myself by, you know, not, uh, you know, allowing myself to express my humanity through my instrument. So, you know, and more importantly, you know, sharing with my kids, that's the most important thing. So, right. Yeah. Someone as talented as you, I mean, it's a kind of a loss for all of us that, you know, when you withdraw like that, but you have to do look as an artist, (laughs) it's about survival, man. And you got to do what you got to do. And yeah, I mean, it, you know, also I was basically kind of chasing my tail, trying to figure out a way, speaking of survival, to try to like financially make ends meet, 
also, you know, I was a, a, a father and I have three kids now. And so I was, I was definitely busy with that, but uh, I have come to realize and admit to myself that I was kind of using that as an excuse as well, you know, to basically like not, you know, do music. So, but yeah. Interesting, interesting. interesting. I mean, did you actually, you know, I see a drum kit behind you today, basically mm -hmm. a little bit of a studio setup. Yeah. I mean, did you usually literally shut it all down, pack it all away, like the instruments? I mean, did you? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, we had had to, we had to move, like physically move like locations, my family, like 15 times in five years. It's a long story, but you know, rent kept on getting raised in certain places. We wouldn't be able to afford it. We'd have to leave that kind of a thing. So, um, so, uh, everything was just packed up anyway, because I was just constantly moving. A lot of the stuff was in storage. Um, a lot of the gear was stored at my parents' house, where my parents' house used to be in Kirkland in their basement. <laughs> and uh, then there was a flood there. And uh, yeah, a bunch of stuff got destroyed, but luckily my drums were up high and uh, all, a lot of other uh, really important stuff luckily survived. So that was kind wow. of a drag. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. That sucks. So with the new record, I mean, how did that like, so you make this uh, relationship with, I suppose, uh, a stranger, maybe both strangers or one stranger? Um, yeah, yeah. How did the writing process kind of take place then? Well, so, so what happened was, is uh, my bright idea was maybe this pig snout will like, let me sit in with them, like do a double drummer thing with, uh, you know, Dahlia or sometimes Lucian played drums too. So uh, whoever was playing at the time. And, um, so I presented that idea to Justin and then he presented that idea to Dahlia and she said, it's a family band. So I got denied. <laughs> <laughs> I was turned down, <clears throat> but I totally respect it. I totally respect that. You know, I figured it was worth a shot and, uh, but I just thought it'd be fun to do. But then my, but ironically, my first time going back and actually sitting down and playing the drums again was to go over and actually sit in and play with Dahlia and Justin. And so I got to do it. It was just, but at their practice space, we played, you know, a couple songs. So it was cool. So, but, um, but, you know, still it's a family band. So I respect that. And uh, then I went and saw um, Justin and Brian's band, other band called Blind Guides. And I saw them play and I saw Brian Gorder play bass for the first time. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> and I was like, dude, because, OK, so the best way I can describe it is um, so like an example would be the band No Means No. This is my opinion. Um, they're a great band. Andy Kerr, their guitar player. There's something about that guy. There was just a fire that you can't really put it, put it into words, but there's just something about his approach, this fire that is the kind of thing that will make a band or if that element is gone, the band just isn't quite the same. And Brian has, as a bass player, has that, that kind of fire. So I was like, man. So I talked to him after they got, after they were finished playing and uh, I went up and talked to Brian and his wife, Nicole, and I just said, someday at some point, man, I was like, we should try to do something. You know, I said, I think we should try to do something and really do something. And he was like, yeah, sure, man. We'll, you know, <laughs> jam. And I was like, no, but I mean, really. And uh, then, um, and then I didn't see uh, or talk to Justin for maybe about a month. And I started feeling myself slipping back into that same mode. Mm. And, uh, then um, I can't remember if it was we went to see them play again, but I went, I saw Justin again. And he looked at me and he goes, dude, when are we going to jam, man? And I was like, yeah, OK. And he goes, I'll bring my amp and my guitar over tomorrow. And so he came over and I set up and we just started playing. And then played again, played one more time. And I said, hey, should we call Brian? <laughs> and he was like, sure. I was like, great. So uh, so then Brian came over and then and then it just, and then it started, you know, it just started. And the songwriting process has been a combination of us either starting to play something and literally, literally the song writing itself from start to finish. It, really, really bizarre mm -hmm. stuff, you know, 
like this song called Lamb to the Slaughter Pulls a Knife. That song basically wrote itself. Uh, and then the other songs have been just like this rapid fire of us just like going back and forth and all of a sudden, boom, done, you know? So it's great. It's a really uh, egoless collaboration. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be working. Yeah, so, so it was a, a seamless thing. It didn't feel like a struggle at all, which is interesting, you know, coming off of the break you had that all this kind of flowed. Well, sure. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I had some cobwebs to shake off, you know, I, I'm still I'm still shaking them off, you know, but uh, it's been a process. But, you know, uh, you know, it took a took a little bit of time before my arms didn't start cramping up after a while and things like that. So, you know, so but I'm getting I'm getting there. So I mean, are you guys going to go out and tour on it? Like once we get this post covid thing kind of yes. somewhat under control? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Touring. That's awesome. Yeah, How do you feel about that? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. I just want to uh, be reasonable about it because, you know, I've got kids and so do they. So, you know, it's like family's first above everything else. You know, everything that was first place goes to second place or third place once kids come into the picture. So, so uh, you know, as long as it isn't, um, we wouldn't be gone for such a long time to where it would, you know, hurt my relationship with them because I can't, I can't, I couldn't do that, you know. So, you know, how old are your kids now? Two. No, oh. no. She just turned three. Sorry. Three, <laughs> three. And then Logan is five. He's about to turn six. So Mayura is three. Logan is six. And Araya is 12. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah. It's too bad you don't live in Nashville like the country guys do, right? Where they just roll out on the weekends, right? You get, get home on a Monday. And yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Kind of a nice system they have actually. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Rock band should imitate that, I think. So. I, I agree. <laughs> no, <laughs> so definitely. Let's do it. So tell me, like, I don't want to go back in time too much. Um, you know, I like to talk about the current and your current projects. Sure. But, you know, you were in the middle of, like, Seattle in the 90s when it mm -hmm. was kind of hopping and um, yeah. signed to Sub Pop. Was yeah. Day Real Estate, one of my, still one of my favorite bands. What a great, great oh, band. Oh, really? Thank you. I oh, absolutely. That. I mean, if Sub Pop hadn't signed you, I'm sure I would have um, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, to be honest, you probably never would have heard of us because the way we signed to Sub Pop was a total fluke. You know, like we tell that story. Sure. Uh, so we were we were essentially confined to the basement of our house for a long time because there was this teen dance ordinance that basically made all ages shows illegal for a while, essentially. So or not even essentially totally so so occasionally we would go to spokane and play a show at this bar i can't remember the one. uh oh this bar is gonna fucking kill me sorry <laughs> it's gonna kill me sorry you can edit that out they're gonna kill me for not remembering the name of the bar but we would go there or sometimes like like we went to tri cities and played a show or we played a new year's eve party in a basement but uh, aside from that there were no shows and the whole seattle thing was kind of exploding at the time so so for anyone who didn't know anyone or wasn't connected to anyone like we weren't where we were not connected to anyone we were in the punk rock scene that was completely separate from that whole seattle thing that was blowing up and uh so um if we you know nate would try to call and get a show like at any place off ramp crocodile and they would just yeah <laughs> click boo, they hang up so but uh then uh, a friend of ours um well, three friends of ours in a band called Engine Kid, which is Greg Anderson, Jay Devitt, and um, Crafty. Uh, they were supposed to play a show at the Crocodile with a band called Skirt, and they had to cancel. And they told Eric Soderstrom, who booked the Crocodile, they said, "Hey, you should get this uh, this other band, Sunny Day Real Estate, and have them play." So he did. We played, and then Eric said, you know, I'm going to put you guys on the sub pop party that's coming up, opening up, playing first, and just see what happens. And then so we did that, and then he went up to Jonathan Poneman, I think, I'm speculating here, and said, you should go watch these guys. Because there was one person, I think, that in the room watching his play, and it was Jonathan. But we didn't know that at the time. So we got done playing, and he literally walked up to the stage and said, hey, do you guys want to make a record? And we were like, what are you talking about? And he was like, I'm Jonathan from Sub Pop. And we started laughing at him because <laughs> I think we were, I don't know. We didn't really know how to react. We just started laughing. And then we were like, wait, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And we we're like, okay, sure. Yeah, that's great. And we we're like, 
we're going to make a record. You know what I mean? Like, you know, making, uh, getting to, you know, have, having the opportunity to go and like make a record and have it released was, you know, that was very far. That was a far off sort of thing that unattainable goal, you know, it seemed. Yeah. How long were you a band at that point? Uh, so Nate and Dan and I had been playing together for at least a year, I think. And then Jeremy, this was probably maybe about, I'm, I'm totally going to guess time is hard. I have a hard time with time, but, uh, uh, it was probably about five months after Jeremy joined. I'm, I'm totally guessing to be honest. Um, right. And in that iteration, I mean, you guys did in that first run is Sunny Day Real Estate. Would you do a couple of records together? Yeah. Oh yeah. With Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. Diary. A couple, couple of records. Um, Bro, you yeah. and Nate get a little sideline and go J- join the, Foo Dave, Fighters, yeah, yeah. To do the Foo Fighters thing. Sure, yeah. Um, obviously, for a drummer, it didn't necessarily work out. Um, yeah. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> and then you kind of came back to Sunny Day Real Estate again and did a couple more records? Um, yeah, we got back together. Um, uh, after I left the Foo Fighters, I was playing with some people, kind of trying to find inspiration again because I was a little bit disenchanted. And... Uh, and um, Plus, you know, you, and also you tour for 17 months playing the same song night after night. And it's kind of like being a kid and experimenting with saying one word over and over again until it stops making sense. It's kind of like that, you know, so I was a little bit burnt out, but, uh, but I was trying to find inspiration, was playing with uh, a guy named Pete Kramiak for a while, who used to be in a band called Verbal Assault. And he kind of actually forced me to sit down, to sit down and play. He was like, come on, man, play. So we recorded some stuff. And then... Um, I was playing in a band called The Replicants for a while out of Olympia, which was kind of just an improv thing. And uh, then uh, then I got a call from Greg Williamson, a friend of ours, who had been working with Jeremy. He recorded the first uh, solo record Jeremy did, Return of the Frog Queen. And uh, he basically started pushing the idea of Jeremy and I and, and Nate and Dan getting together. So then... We at first, I think we're going to try to release these like songs that were from demos and stuff. But then we went to Jeremy's basement and I set up my drums and we kind of just started writing and then wrote how it feels to be something on most of most of it in that basement. So, yeah, it'd be wow. crazy. Yeah. Wow. So then, I mean, so you're like early 2000s then was kind of like a blend of different bands um, until you kind of. Yeah. Your sabbatical. Yeah. Well, no, so yeah. So then, so then we made how it feels. Then we made the rising tide after that. And then, uh, then Jeremy and I did the fire theft record with Nate after that. And, uh, and then I had another band called, uh, Brawley Banks that I was playing with. And, um, and then, then the sunny day reunion tour happened and that was around 2009. And then, um, tried tracking we tried tracking some stuff for a new record it it didn't get followed through on and so i was a little bit bummed about that and then uh that's what i kind of was i just kind of said to hell with it for a while wow. yeah were you ever disappointed by that with sunny day real estate because my feeling was um they should have been a much it should have been a much more uh popular and commercially successful band in my humble opinion well i mean um, you know when you spend the first part of your whatever career as a band not doing any interviews and and refusing to do photo shoots and then you keep breaking up you know what i mean it's like you know it's a recipe for you know should have but didn't quite you know so so you know it's kind of only to be expected really so disappointment i i to be honest i i'm i'm not because what what i've always wanted to do is I have always wanted to be in a band. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a Beatle. And to me, being a Beatle meant being in a gang, but a music gang and everybody is, you know, an important key element, you know, in the process and in the the music. And uh, so, and I feel like Sunny Day Real Estate accomplished, I'm not comparing us to the Beatles, but I'm saying that, I'm saying that we achieved like an authentic, uh, documentation of the human experience through music and 
And I think that that has been what has impacted people, um, maybe not on a large scale, but it doesn't really matter to me as long as that's what, you know, it means to people is something authentic. So, right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've got still very hardcore set of fans there with that band, I would assume. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, yeah, I'm, I was surprised actually that, you know, I kind of stopped paying attention and then I started getting uh, word that, you know, there were some people that were kind of moved by what we did. So, so that's a great thing, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, in any band up in Seattle in the nineties, who was kind of a little self-destructive with their <laughs> career. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I think that was kind of a, a commodity and trade of uh, Seattle. So. Yeah. Well, we weren't doing it to be fashionable, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, I know that. I but know. yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Few, few were. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. No, nobody was, but uh, few, few were. Yeah. So you're a hell of a drummer. I mean, who were like your kind of early influences? What made you, uh, what attracted you to playing the drums? Like who were your guys or girls? Uh, Yeah. Uh, Well, when I was a kid, when I was five, uh, my brother had a drum kit and it was set up in the basement. And I I watched him play a couple of times. And I remember just seeing the, the, the beater hit the bass drum head. And to me, that was like, the most powerful, amazing thing all I'd ever seen. And, uh, and then being the youngest of nine kids, I had a lot of, uh, you know, the older brothers and sisters that were constantly playing Steely Dan, Stevie Wonder. Yes. The Beatles, Led Zeppelin. Uh, I mean, I could just go on and on and on Pink Floyd. And, um, so, so I was constantly surrounded by that and, um, and grew up with it and just constantly music all the time. And I wanted to play drums when I was about five and then took me until I was 13 to finally wear my parents down <laughs> to, get, to get them to get me a drum kit. And then, so, and then, then, um, so and when I was 12, my brother played me Permanent Ways by Rush, Quadrophenia. He really started like taking me on this journey. And, uh, and then that just completely that 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 set me over the edge i was just like i need a drum kit now bought a leather jacket <laughs> you know I was, you know and uh yeah so keith moon and john bottom were like you know like two of my very first like superheroes <laughs> at, at that that's age that's awesome neil what was, how old were you when you finally joined your first band then still a teen no no so i started my first band right after i got my drums for the first time <laughs> Yeah, just ba- ba- yeah, basically with two friends of mine in grade school, and neither of them played anything, but one of them had a crappy keyboard, and we grabbed a mic, a little PV amp, and I got a you know this crazy stupid looking guitar, and uh, yeah, it was terrible. We were called the Screaming Hormones. Yeah, oh, terrible, terrible, fantastic. But I had to start somewhere, so you I just kept the st- yeah, yeah. So and then yeah, and then when I got into high school, I met a guy named John Atkins who actually really played bass. And then also play guitar and he could actually play. And then that was the beginning of my uh, journey of actually learning how to really play music, even though, you know, still took me a while, you know? Yeah. And I mean, is there like, you know, you've played with a lot of people, but I mean, do you still have most of your affinity kind of with Nate? I mean, do you guys have a chemistry with each other? I mean, is that someone you're still very close to through all of this? I, mean, I, I haven't talked to Nate in... I guess since about since 2011. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, not saying I'm not close to them. I'm just saying I haven't talked to them, but, uh, yeah, but, uh, but I talked to Jeremy on the phone last night and I actually talked to Dan from Sunday day today. So, so that was cool. Yeah. So yeah, I'm close with them. Awesome. So on the new record, I heard the single supervise suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really great. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's thanks somewhat retro but it's not it's fresh and it's t- it's today and who yeah. helped you with the record did you self-produce the record or did someone produce the record with you no we we did it ourselves but i have to say ourselves meaning primarily justin Tominga. he did all the heavy lifting you know we worked together but i was more of a uh, uh, an, uh, an ear you know t- like a compass but using my ear for things but he was the man that engineered everything and we just started doing it and just slowly he started improving and getting better and learning more and and now he's getting really good and so the new record we're working on our second record right now we're about 70 percent done with it and uh 
we've we've made you know leaps and bounds as far you know as far as the last uh process and recording but so we've learned a lot so yeah yeah was the current record done like earlier and then with the whole pandemic thing did you kind of just push back a little bit kept pushing back or well it- so yeah so we basically we were we just were recording the stuff and then um and then learning as we go justin was learning things about just mixing and stuff and improving and then of course it took time to figure out a way to put it out the best way to put it out we we're like okay we originally were just going to do it ourselves but then uh john fraser from spartan got a hold of us and we had a conversation and then decided to do it that way so the pandemic kind of threw things off in the sense that normally like you uh, you know make a record and then you go out and you start playing shows and you tour and we actually had a tour that we were going to do and that got canceled so since that element completely was taken away going out and playing we just kept we just kept writing and kept recording which is why we're 70 percent into the next record <laughs> so you know what i mean so it kind of throws the equilibrium equilibrium off because you know you're pretty much what you normally would do was taken out of the uh you know taken out of the pictures so we just just kept recording so yeah right. and if you go out touring man is that something you see doing as a you know more of a package thing with somebody i mean was that your intent on that tour that canceled or is it more you guys going out headlining doing your own thing uh we were you know what i it's been it was so long ago that i can't remember exactly what it was whether we were going to tour somebody or whether we were just playing select uh shows with different people i i just can't remember it was so long ago (laughs) (laughs) it was like it was like right before the whole thing hit or actually a little ways before but yeah we're all with you on that. We all feel the same way over the last uh, year. Yeah, carpet being pulled. <laughs> yeah, well, ti- well, time and place being hard to do anymore. Oh yeah, sure, you know, absolutely. Kind of- yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard. Um, so I wanted to ask you: Is there any now that you're kind of back into music, creating your own music? Is there anything you're listening to currently of anyone else that's kind of like taken you by surprise that you really dig? Um. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of being stuck in my back catalog, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I, but, uh, uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of bands that I, that are doing really good things that I've heard. Like there's a band called the Caterpillars. They're really cool. Uh, and, uh, but, but my, I'm, my brain is so trapped in, in, so what I need to do is I need to break out of that and I need to actually start listening to more new music. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm stuck on a lot of stuff I've been listening to for a long time. So, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, the thing is with it, it's, it's all available to you now, you know, it's this huge pipeline flowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it's fantastic because what's not available, but at the same time, it's just yeah. sometimes overwhelming and you just don't know where to even. Yeah. Actually, just, Justin has been good uh, in that way. Like, uh, you know, he'll be he'll throw out this band, and I'm like, wait, who's that? And he's like, oh, I know, and he'll play it for me. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that he's played for me that's blown me away. But my brain is kind of overwhelmed by there's a lot. So yes, there's a lot of great new stuff, but I'm still trying to uh, process it all essentially. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> and can we expect? I mean, have you repackaged any of the Sunny Day stuff? I mean, is there like a new remastered or songs that didn't get put on any of those records that you're repackaging or not? Uh, th- there's, I, I found some cassette tapes that have some demo stuff and have some interesting songs. Like one thing, one song that I was like, wait a minute, when did we do that? <laughs> you know, totally, you know, but it was recorded in the basement with like a boom box, but I mean, still, so, um, I found a few things, but, um, whether or not anything's ever going to be done with that, I, I, I just don't know. I, I'm not I'm not certain. I'll have to talk to Jeremy and Dan about it. So. Come on, Jeremy and Dan. It's, you oh, know, yeah, it's I, 25 I, year anniversaries or something going on here. Yeah. You catch the wave. Well, so. I mean, I, I, I to be honest, um, I actually hadn't told them about the songs that I found yet. So, so I just found them recently. So, you know, breaking so news. They have to listen to the podcast then. And yeah. Know, so. Yeah, I know. Sorry, guys. I, <laughs> But yeah, 
but yeah, but yeah, it's good to be to still be in contact with with both of them, and so it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's that's good. awesome. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. So, yeah, and I mean, you know, so you've go th- you go through these bands, you have different iterations, different bands, things break up. Uh, I don't know whether it's other people, your own decisions, you know, how that all works out. I mean, are there regrets of anything in your past that you think um, you could have kept your career on a different path or do you have no regrets? And this is like, this is I, just- I, I don't have any regrets in the sense that if things w- would have gone differently, I probably wouldn't have the children that I have. And so, so whatever path it was, however inconvenient or bumpy that road was, it led me to them. And that's what that's what matters the most to me. And then also, if things hadn't gone differently, uh, I think if things had gone differently, I probably wouldn't have the band be an assertion now. And it's really, really important to me, this band. And I just have a whole new appreciation and respect for the process and just feel it just feels good to create. Again, you know, it's just one of those things where it's it just to express yourself in that way. It's just a really great thing to do. So I'm glad to be doing it. But so no regrets in that sense to where, you know, everything happened the way it happened and I'm here. So essentially, no. Yeah. I love that. Well, that's yeah. a healthy attitude. And I mean, I'm really picking up on your enthusiasm for the band, yeah. the new band, yeah. and the new music. And I'm really excited for you. I'm happy for you that... Thanks. This has come I appreciate together it. and the timing's right for you. And uh, yeah, yeah, I don't foresee this band like suddenly breaking up because uh, you know we, we just things are different now. You know, everything is in uh, perspective has changed for I think anyone at our age. You know what I mean? You know, right. so and we're well, and you've all, got some good balance now, right? You got the yeah, kids. Yeah. I mean, there's just balance in life, so it's probably a really healthy time for you. So that's awesome. Yeah, well, I try. I'm trying to keep everything balanced. So I'm chasing my tail much of the time, but yes, ultimately, big picture wise, balanced. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Congratulations! It's what we're all seeking is some balance. So. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, William, thank you for your time. I'm really excited. Uh, thank the you. Man's assertion. The new record's out in April. Yes, sir. Um, we'll definitely have links to that on our website. Um, okay. And I'm really happy for you. And congratulations. I, the music sounds incredible. Thank you so much. And it's great to see you again. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, 26 years, uh, I'll be dead the next time 26 years comes. No, so you I better don't do think it so. sooner than that. So. I, I disagree. I don't think you will be. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Stay healthy. All right. You too. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening this week. To follow what's going on with this podcast, you can go to the radicalpod.com theradicalpod.com. You will find show notes and past episodes and uh, even a little swag there if you want a t-shirt or a hat. I would be honored if you'd subscribe at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Till next week. 